thank you parents for peace for inviting me to be a part of this panel this much needed conversation thank you for your kind words on this fifth anniversary what i call the charleston massacre five years ago on june 17th 2015 a young white supremacist walked into Emmanuel AME Church to shoot and kill as many people as he could. They welcomed this young man into the church. He asked to be seated next to Reverend Pinckney and that's where he was. So after about an hour of reading, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, the parable of the sower. They gathered in a circle for dismissal. While they had their eyes closed and their heads bowed, Dylan Roof took out his Glock 45 and slaughtered them like they were animals. I hadn't lived in Charleston in more than 40 plus years. And I lived in Dallas, Texas at that time. And that Wednesday night kind of was a regular night for me at the hospital. Circumstances happened that I needed to go back to my office to retrieve some death paperwork because I had been working with a family whose grandfather had died and ran down to my office and I say that the spirit of the Lord sent me to my telephone because it was on my desk charging and I would have kept going. I would not have checked my phone, but I saw that I had three missed calls from my daughter and that put me on high alert because that was something unusual. So I took the time and I had to go into another little place, you know, because my phone didn't work well in my office. So I went into the conference room and got into the phone corner and called my daughter. And that's when she said my nephew had called from Charleston and said something had happened at the church. And my first question to her was what church? And she said, Ma, Granny's church. So now I'm even more on alert because I know that was Wednesday night. My mom's opened the doors of that church and closed that night. And I knew that she would be in Bible study. But I was at my job, so I had to go back. I had to deal with the family. I get back downstairs to my office, get into the phone corner and started calling people. I, I called my mother's phone. I don't know, I, I called her phone. And of course it went to voicemail and I knew she would never hear my message because she didn't know how to get the messages out the phone. I called my sister. She didn't know. She didn't have the TV on, but she said, okay, I'm going to put my clothes on and go down to the church. And that's when the nightmare started for me. I turned on the TV and saw the news that was going on. And um, I left early from Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. And took me about an hour to get home because I was crying and I couldn't see to drive and I had to stop my car and park. But I made it home and turned on the television hoping to get some word and I called my nephew back and was like, auntie, they won't let us near the church. We don't know what's going on. They just keep saying uh, their fatalities. They're not saying anything. My sister Nadine had went to the hospital because it was word that people went to the hospital, this carried. But the only person that was carried to the hospital was Reverend Daniel Simmons, because everybody else had died. I fell asleep and the chaplain called about 2.30, 3.30 Central Time. And when my niece said that the chaplain wanted to talk to me, 
I knew, I just started to scream. I don't even think I heard what she said to me. So that's how five years ago on a Wednesday night, when my life turned upside down. <clears throat> but even in my life being turned upside down, I'm a person of great faith an ordained minister. So I knew as time started to move on and move past, things started to really, realizations of things started to open itself up in a spiritual way where before it never did for me because I was an angry daughter. I was in rage. I was in a fog. I didn't know what to do. Talking about forgiveness was one of the highlights that came out of that tragedy where the world looked at my sister and others in that courtroom that day when they were given a chance to say to Dylan Roof what they wanted to say to him. And my sister was the first one to say, I forgive you, Dylan Roof. And here I scream and holler again because I felt like here again, I'm hearing words that I just can't believe. So my journey towards the forgiveness was not as easy as it was for my sister and the other people. It took me a while to reconcile that. So all of this has happened to me, but because of Charleston, there are things that God has seen fit to open our eyes to look at how much more we need to work on uh, racial tensions, how we can't let ourselves be indoctrinated to hate through white supremacy, white ideology groups. God was showing the world that we don't have to riot and tear down our city because we're going to show the world what could happen if it could really happen every day that gun sales are through the roof, that the Charleston loophole, the law that would have kept Dylan Roof from buying his gun has sat on Mitch McConnell's desk. There are so many things that came out of Charleston that are still riveting and, and, and the ripple effect is still happening because it will always happen until we find a way to be willing to work and live and listen to each other and be authentic, to be willing to hear the hard things, not to fix anybody, but let me walk with you while we figure this out. So in the honor of my mother and those eight angels, that gave their lives for a higher power in that church. The rest of my life will be spent honoring them and teaching people that hate does not win and the story of those nine black souls in that church. Thank you.